we're going to take a look at the actual substances that you saw in that video of the chemical reaction between sodium metal and chlorine gas to make NaCl. So as we're thinking about the different types of compounds and eventually looking at bonding, um, this demonstration sort of has all of them there. It has a metallic type bond, it has a covalent bond material, and there's also an ionically bonded material. So let's take a look at the two reactants, the two ingredients that go into making sodium chloride as we would find them in their elemental state. This isn't necessarily how they're found in nature, but this is just how they um, would appear to us as pure elements. And the first one is chlorine gas. And so this is Cl2. You can kind of see it's a yellowish gas, which means at room temperature, it's well above its boiling point. So remember, any substance will exist as a, a solid, a liquid, or a gas, depending upon the temperature and its melting and boiling points. So apparently room temperature is well above the boiling point of chlorine. So all the liquid chlorine has boiled away and now it exists as this gas. In the same way, if we got above 100 degrees Celsius, liquid water would boil away and turn into gaseous steam. That would be its natural state. On the other hand, over here is sodium metal. So we're gonna take a little bit closer look at this in a minute, but it's in this jar and it looks like some whitish lumps and things like that. It doesn't really look like a nice metal. In fact, I pulled a little piece out right here. And I don't know, that doesn't really look like a metal to me. It just looks like a kind of a whitish rock. And the question is, it's also wet. As I'll show you in a minute, sodium metal is very, very reactive. It's so reactive that we have to keep it sealed under um, an oil so that it doesn't react with air. And even that isn't completely helpful because we've got this white coating on the outside that's actually an oxide layer. It's the product of sodium metal reacting with oxygen from the air. So I'll cut this open and show it to you in a minute. But let's look at the final product of those two things reacting together, something very different. And that is sodium chloride, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So here are some bigger chunks of NaCl. They look kind of cubical in nature. We'll take a little bit closer look at that in a minute as well. But we've got our granular NaCl that you might have, you know, in your salt shaker at home. This big clump right there, that is how uh, sodium chloride is often found when it's mined as a mineral, when it's not extracted from salt water. And uh, that is a mineral called halite. But you can kind of see, it's interesting, it's got a particular shape, right? Um, it's taped to the top of that bottle, but you can see all the right angles involved, just like we would expect if you looked at little sodium chloride crystals of table salt. So you can see here, kind of a cubical nature. So what I want to do next is take a look at the structure at the atomic level of these three different substances. Um, just to kind of compare how they're put together and to differentiate what we mean by molecular, metallic, ionic, a pure substance, an element, and a compound, all of those great things are happening here. So let's take a look at that. So first, let's take a look at the structure and kind of get a feel for, uh, virtually, um, the structure of chlorine. So this is what we would call an element, Cl2. That's the way that chlorine is typically found in nature. Chlorine, we find it as a gas. If we can, well, as I'll talk about a little bit later, we don't necessarily find chlorine in nature this way. Chlorine's so reactive that it's combined with other things in nature. Uh, mostly in the form of things like sodium chloride and other salts. But if we can make chlorine into its pure element, this is its form at room temperature. So this is what's called a molecule. It's a model of a molecule. Um, this is two chlorine atoms bonded together. You can see I can hold this thing in my hand. That's what we call a discrete molecule. Discrete means separate or individual. So this is all I need to say about chlorine. Um, in other words, in terms of identifying it, just Cl2. There's no greater structure to it. 
This is the smallest unit I can make and still have it called chlorine, molecular chlorine, Cl2. So it's just two atoms of Cl bonded together. If I go in there and break this apart, then I no longer have chlorine, Cl2. I have something that is not stable at room temperature, and those are individual chlorine atoms. They're both elements, but this is the atomic form of chlorine, and that's the molecular form of chlorine. And so that's what's inside this bottle. Uh, just a huge collection of little Cl2 molecules bouncing around. This is still a pure substance. This is not a compound. So this is an elemental molecule, and it's held together by what's called a covalent bond. That's the thing that's joining these two atoms together. Now we're going to take a little bit closer look at the sodium metal, just so we can see if it actually is a metal. So I've got that hunk of sodium, and I've also got a, a butter knife here. And unlike other metals that you're probably used to experiencing, like iron and aluminum and things like that, Sodium and all the group 1A elements, sodium, potassium, and so on, are really soft, but they're also very highly reactive. So in fact, um, I guess I can show you, I can probably pick this up and I can just bend it. It almost has the consistency of chewing gum, very soft. But it still doesn't seem like a metal, but if I cut it open, You can see that it's shiny. And one thing I think you can see already that it, you might have noticed that it started out sort of silvery, but um, it's already starting to get kind of a colorful coating on it. And that's very common for metals that are reactive. This sodium is rusting before your eyes. It's combining with oxygen. And on the surface, it's forming sodium oxide, just another chemical reaction. But we can see that it did start out nice and shiny. And uh, maybe I can make another cut here. So it does look metallic. I'm not convinced that showing you this on video is the best way to demonstrate that, but this is the biggest piece of sodium we had left in the department. Um, so it's a metal. It does everything that metals do. It conducts electricity and heat very well. So it's got all of these metallic properties. And so what is it about the structure of sodium that keeps it together as a solid, although a soft one, as you can see here. Um, but what does the structure of sodium look like down at the atomic level? Well, here on the right, we've got the model of the structure of sodium metal. And on the left, you can still see the structure of a Cl2 molecule, that discrete, separate, individual molecule. Now, now I want us to think about how is sodium different? Well, this represents a piece of any hunk of sodium that you might come across. Sodium is also an element, but it's not a molecule. Whereas I showed you before, if I split that Cl2 down, I no longer have molecular chlorine and it's chlorine atoms and they have different properties altogether. So when I came by with my knife before and sliced through that sodium, I came through, all I'm really doing is coming down and slicing off a piece of sodium. And now I have two. And each one of these is sodium, but they don't really look alike at all in terms of their shape. However, they are still within every individual part maintaining their sort of arrangement, how they're stacked together. This is called a crystal arrangement or crystalline arrangement. It may not have looked like it, but that sodium metal that was all soft was actually crystalline. We don't often think of metals as being crystalline in our everyday life, but they definitely are. And so, the crystalline just means that the particles that make up that substance are in a nice orderly arrangement repeated over and over and over again. So the difference I want you to think about 
is the difference between uh, what we call a discrete molecule, which is this little chlorine over here that I can just pick up, and that's all the chlorine I need. This is the minimum amount I need in order to call it chlorine, uh, Cl2. But for sodium, I can pick up a variety of amounts, amounts of this substance, number of atoms, and I can still call that sodium. In fact, if I want to make a great big piece of sodium, all I have to do is just keep on piling on more atoms. Just keep building and building and building. And a piece of sodium as big as what's in this jar would be billions upon billions of atoms just extending out in all dimensions based on the structure that looks something like this. So we call a molecule a discrete substance or a discrete structure, but something like sodium and the other metals, this is an element that exists in what's called an extended structure. It extends in all dimensions up until we run to the edge of that piece of solid. It's an extended structure. It's very different than a molecule. Do you get it? Discrete, individual, it's just a collection of those little Cl2s. Sodium is just sort of this blob, this crystalline blob that extends over and over and over and over. It just repeats over and over and over again the building of the atoms. And breaking it down doesn't destroy it. It just makes us have a smaller piece. So these two things are both elements, right? So they're an example of an element, chlorine and sodium, but these are elemental structures. That's an elemental molecule of chlorine. And this is what we call an elemental extended structure for sodium. There is no molecule of sodium, right? You could ask yourself, is that molecular sodium? No, because I can always make it into something else. The smallest unit of sodium that remains sodium is just a single atom, Na+. Any more than that builds into this extended structure, just piles on together. That's kind of the key difference. The smallest unit for this elemental metal is just a single atom. Let's take a look at sodium chloride, the third type of bonding, which is ionic bonding. Now, sodium chloride looks like what you would think of as a crystal, right? I mean, it's got this sort of a shape associated with it. It's sparkly. Um, you collect them all together. It's got sort of this white crystalline. And how does it compare in terms of its physical properties compared to chlorine and sodium? Well, chlorine's a gas, and that behaves like gases. Um, sodium, we saw, was really soft and malleable. Um, that's kind of the you know definition of a metal. Um, if I took a hammer and smashed sodium, it would just deform. All metals do that. Um, I did it with a knife. It was so soft and malleable. But what if I took a hammer, like I have here, and took it to a piece of um, NaCl? Could it deform? Could it be gooey and soft like a metal? You might think of uh, iron as being very hard, like at the end of this hammer, but you can see dents in it. Um, if I take another hammer and smash it into this hammer, it'll deform. It's just the atoms sliding around past each other. But I'm gonna try this here on video. I'm gonna take one of these little shapes and uh, take a whack at it with a hammer. So one thing that's interesting that you might be able to see, try and zoom in here, is that after I shattered it, I still had smaller pieces that look sort of like there's lots of right angles in there. They're not exactly squares, but you can see sort of rectangular. All the angles of the shattered crystal are, for the most part, at the macro scale, uh, right angles. So I wonder if I take one of these and do that again, will I continue to get right angles?
And you can see this one, I'll set it down there. That is also a series of right angles. So you see those smaller pieces? They all come off, they all have right angles. And if I continue smashing it down smaller and smaller and smaller, until I get to what you're used to as table salt, if I could zoom in a little bit better, unfortunately I can't, but you probably can find some table salt at home. Oops. Um, you can go and take a look at that and you'll see that they're little kind of cubicle things just like we have here. So we want to think about what's the structure at the atomic level that makes sodium chloride be brittle and why would it be always breaking down into smaller and smaller chunks that are right angles to each other. So this is a model of the crystalline structure of sodium chloride. Do you see the cube? Do you see all the right angles? They're all right there down at the atomic level. And so you notice we had a variety, you can see over here I'm pointing to it, we had structures, we had crystals of sodium chloride. They're all different sizes. But we would still call every one of these things a piece of sodium chloride in the same way that I could take different sized pieces of sodium and call that sodium metal. So we can kind of think then that sodium chloride must have structure have a structure that has similarities to sodium metal. And it does. In fact, you know, this doesn't represent the smallest piece of sodium chloride I could imagine. It's a small piece, but it's certainly not the smallest. I could decide if I wanted to and have my giant knife come in here and cut it in half this way or cut it down like that. And I could imagine smaller pieces. That's what I did over here. So um, the idea, though, is this is not a molecule. It's because the electrons in a molecule, like we have over here with chlorine, are shared in the region between the two atoms. And that makes a covalent bond. But as you saw in the video, the electrons in an ionic compound have been transferred. They came off of the sodium metal, got transferred to the Cl2, and then something new and completely different was created. We no longer had the extended structure of sodium, which I can remind you of over there. And we don't have the discrete molecule of chlorine, which is over there on the left. We've got this brand new thing, which is now no longer an element, but is a compound. In other words, a combination of two or more elements, in this case, just two. But they're chemically changed, right? The chlorines have an extra electron per chlorine atom to make a chloride ion, and the sodium has lost one electron to give it a sodium plus charge, give it a sodium ion. And those two things are just grouped together as ions in another arrangement. And so we say that this is a discrete structure, and any structure that looks like this of any size, we're going to call sodium chloride. And the thing about an extended structure that is different from a molecule is that if I look at one of these white ions right here, let's call that chloride, when we think of the formula NaCl, we think that there I should be able to, in my hand, hold out, you know, like I did with chlorine, something that might look like this. And we hear people incorrectly say sodium chloride molecules all the time. Molecules imply that there would be an Na and Cl pair that I could pick up that would be separate from all the other ones. But that's just not true. We don't know which red sodium ion actually belongs to that chloride. Could it be this one, this one, this one, this one, the one back here, there's another one sticking out in the front. Same thing, pick a sodium atom. We don't know, there's not, you know, it doesn't have a particular partner um, in the same way that in a molecule does. So we know that this chlorine atom is attached to that chlorine atom. Here's another example of a discrete molecule. This is ammonia. So this is the molecule when you have household ammonia. There's a whole bunch of these dissolved in water. But every ammonia, there's a particular correspondence. Here's a nitrogen with three hydrogens on the side. It has a very, very specific arrangement, 
But this hydrogen and this hydrogen and this hydrogen is always bonded to that nitrogen. You break that apart, you no longer have ammonia. It's discrete. I can hold a single ammonia molecule in my hand. Water is the same way. These are molecular compounds. How is the hydrogen attached to the nitrogen? Through shared covalent bonding. Each one of these is a pair of electrons that are shared between the two of those. And so that belongs over here with other covalent molecules. That isn't true here. Electrons aren't shared. They were exchanged. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of sodium atoms and chloride, sorry, sodium ions and chloride ions, and that's why the formula is NaCl. But I wouldn't write this formula as like Na30Cl30. I mean, imagine every time I picked up a piece of sodium chloride and I wanted to write the formula for it, I would have to count how many ions there are. So in an ionic compound, all we have to do is specify what's the ratio What's the proportion of sodium ions to chloride ions in the overall structure? It's the same whether you have a tiny little grain like I have down here or a great big hunk like it's at the top of this jar. And it's represented at the atomic level like this. So the arrangement of the crystals, as we'll see later, gives us a clue to why we see crystals of different shapes up here in the macroscopic world. So I hope this uh, little video helps you get a better handle on the difference between these things. And let me just zoom out. We can see all three of those again. And the idea is that when we look at these three, we've got all three types of bonding. We have extended structures, which are these two, sodium chloride and sodium. We've got molecules like Cl2, and I showed you ammonia. We've got two elements over here, sodium and chlorine. And over here, I've got a compound. All three are pure substances. This represents pure sodium chloride. That's pure chlorine. That's pure sodium. I've got pure molecular covalently bonded molecules. I've got pure ionically bonded sodium chloride, a compound, and I've got pure elemental sodium, which is held together by a different type of bond called a metallic bond. It's different than covalent, it's not molecular. It's different than ionic, this is a compound.